Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has birthed us again to a living hope, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, Lord God, thank you for those words, your word, through Peter in 1 Peter and God, we confess that we just like barely even begin to catch the edge of what I just read. So Holy Spirit, we need your help. Um, would you preach your word? Uh, would you preach yourself, Lord Jesus, within us as I stand up here and say stuff? <laughs> In your name, amen. Hey, uh, the title of last week's sermon was Milkmen Gone Sour. And the title of this week's sermon is Milkman Gone Extra Sour. Last week's sermon really uh, uh, was the introduction to this sermon. And this sermon is really the last three or five minutes of last week's sermon. In 1 Peter 2, 2, Peter writes this. As newborn babies long for the pure logikos or logikos spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If milk sits, it can go sour. And if water sits, it's no longer living. Or in biblical parlance, it's no longer fresh. You know, uh, well water can be rather nasty. And so to the woman at the well, Jesus said, I have living water. I've got fresh water. Milk can go sour, water can get stagnant, and the life can die, which is just a crazy concept if, if you think about it. We think of death as the absence of life, but the Bible speaks of death as a life separated from the life. You know, like a bottle of water that's separated from the stream. Scripture says that Jesus has or had the power of an indestructible life. And Jesus said, I am the life. And yet, the life was entombed in the earth. And in earthen vessels, <laughs> which are us. To the woman at the well, Jesus said, the water that I give will become in you a fountain welling up to eternal life. So for weeks we've been talking about life as a communion of sacrifice and the freedom uh, called love. And, and last week we made the point that this forgiveness, which is life, is really not your decision. It's God's decision. In you, the life is in the blood. Your, um, the blood vessel you can't make this happen. You have to let this happen. And, and that's what the word that gets translated forgiveness, a me, actually means. To let. Forgiveness is letting life happen. Last week I told you the story of Ben the milkman gone sour. According to Reader's Digest, in the fall of 1962, Ben the Milkman discovered that a woman on his route uh, had, had like apparently skipped town, leaving a $79 debt behind, which in 1962 was a whole lot for a milkman. He had been wholesome, nourishing, and kind, prototypical milkman, but within a few weeks, holding a grudge, he had become sour. And so worried about him, a friend said, my grandma used to tell me if someone takes something from you, just give it to them, and then you can't be robbed. Ben, she said, well, why don't you give the milk to that lady and her kids for Christmas? That is, turn a debt into a gift. You see, that's forgiveness. That's what Jesus did on the tree in the garden at the edge of space, time, and eternity. We took his life, which is the life, right? As our very own. And he gave his life as a gift, crying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They, 
who as we did not have knowledge of good and evil, but that we did that is evil. And that he did that is good. And that he let us do that is called forgiveness. And you see, I think this is the thing that really just blew Peter's mind. We got to remember that Peter, Peter was with Jesus when he walked on the water. Peter watched Jesus calm a storm, raise the dead. Peter was with him on the mountain when he was transfigured and began shining like the sun and Moses and Elijah showed up. And so, of course, it was Peter that said, may it not be. This can never happen to you, Jesus. When Jesus said the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And of course, it was Peter then that succumbed to Satan's temptation, confessing three times, I, I never knew the man. And yet we also must remember that it was Peter to whom the resurrected Jesus said three times, feed my sheep, Peter. In other words, uh, Peter, you will still build my church, Peter the rock. See, Peter was amazed that Jesus would forgive him and still call him the rock. Peter was amazed that Jesus, the one who shone brighter than the sun, who had all power, would let us take his life. But even more, I think it was made that he would forgive his life to all of us the night before, saying, drink of it, all of you. In Greek, the word translated forgiveness, like I said, means to let. In English, the word forgive also means to give before, for forgive. Jesus forgave you long before you ever sinned against him, and check this out, long before you ever had the wisdom to ask for forgiveness. He is your wisdom to ask for forgiveness. An old friend of mine, um, Tony Campolo, was waiting for a, a flight in Norfolk, Norfolk, I think that's how you say it, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, he was sitting next to this old black man who appeared to be sleeping when, when he noticed this jealous young evangelist, you know, making his way down the row of, of tired, busy people at the airport, asking folks if they'd been saved, and then challenging them to make a decision. He asked the old man sitting next to Tony, excuse me, sir, are you saved? The old man slowly opened his eyes and softly said, I am. The young evangelical inquisitor then shot back, can you tell me exactly when you were saved? And he said, well, not exactly. See, it was 2,000 years ago. And as his smile slowly crossed his face, he said, but... I just found out about it rather recently. <laughs> forgiveness utterly amazed Peter. And even though he never uses the word forgiveness in First or Second Peter, it's all that he's talking about. On, on Easter, Jesus appeared to Peter and the disciples saying, quote, this is from Luke, it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to all nations. That's all people. And notice that forgiveness is not a bargain. It's a proclamation. And you see, it's this proclamation that Peter is proclaiming in his epistles. Acts 5.31, having been arrested, Peter announces to the high council, the Sanhedrin in Israel, from the temple, he says this, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader, archegon in Greek, author, founder, pioneer, and savior to give repentance. Metanoia, that's a new mind. That's a paradigm shift. You cannot change your mind with your mind. Repentance must be a gift. God exalted him to give, to grant repentance to Israel and, or that is, 
forgiveness of sins. You alone cannot decide to repent in order to be forgiven. It's the gift of forgiveness that creates the repentance in you. You see, Peter was amazed that God would forgive us our sins, and I think he was more amazed that God would repent us of our sins, that is, give us the mind of Christ, that is, give us the righteousness of Christ, that is, grace. We're saved by grace through faith, and this not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Peter was amazed at grace. Grace is the logical milk. It's the life of Christ given to us, but when we hold it to ourselves as if it's our own possession, as if we created it or made it or, or, or earned it, it was something we deserve, the milk goes sour. Or I should say, we go sour. The milk itself is imperishable, just as Jesus is imperishable, even though we imprison him in an earthen tomb for a time. When we refuse to forgive, we imprison the milk in our gut for a time, and we turn sour. My friend Philip uh, wrote about a prostitute who came to a counselor friend of his in Chicago. And uh, through sobs, this, this woman, this prostitute, told him how she had been renting out her two-year-old daughter to men. to pay for her drug habit. She was utterly undone, horrified at herself. Not knowing what to say, he asked her if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. I'll never forget the look of pure, naive shock that crossed her face, he told Philip. Church, she cried. Why would I go there? I was already feeling horrible about myself. That would only make me feel worse. That's the opening story in Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace. It's one of my favorite books. He's asking, how did evangelicals, which literally means good news tellers, ever get so sour? I consider myself to be a good news teller, but evangelicals are not currently considered to be the sweetest people in our society nowadays. One day I went skiing with Philip just after that book came out. On the way up I-70, I remember he said, Peter, you just would not believe the, the kickback that I've gotten for that book. You would not believe all the angry letters that I've received for that book, What's So Amazing About Grace. And I, I think he said that right after I asked him about his thoughts about God's ability to make all things new. And he turned to me and he said, are you trying to get me in trouble? <laughs> I've had the amazing privilege. I mean, I was thinking about this. Earlier. This is really incredible. But I've had the amazing privilege of personally knowing all my favorite living authors. Those, uh, they're those that I think have written most beautifully and logically about grace. That's Philip Yancey, Tony Campolo, and Brennan Manning. In the 80s, Tony was branded a, a heretic for claiming that what we do to the least of these, we do to Jesus. <laughs> as if, as if Jesus was actually like an imperishable seed in every human being. In the 90s, Brennan was accused of being a quote-unquote universalist. And, and so I remember he desperately backpedaled as if universalist meant that he didn't believe in Jesus. I know that each one of them had this living hope that the grace of God would save all people through the death and the resurrection of, resurrection of, of Jesus the Christ. But, but each of them had to be incredibly careful about suggesting such things or even hoping for such things, because the authorities said, it's impossible. In 2007, I had lunch with Philip the week I was defrocked, and I let him know, Philip, I think I actually would believe how many angry letters you got and all the kickback that you got for writing what's so amazing about grace. 
And you know, I, I don't know, I went back through the book, uh, uh, scanned it real quickly again, but I don't know that he even ventured to suggest what I perceive and what I think Peter perceived to be most amazing about grace. And, and it's a great book. But, but you see, what I think is most amazing about grace is that in reality, it's all that is. <laughs> In other words, it's not a small thing in a big thing, like just a baby in a manger, or a man on a, a cross, one man in this big and painful world, or, or an exception to the rule, or you know, like an anomaly in reality. It's not a small thing in a big thing, it's actually the only thing that's anything. But no things do seem like everything to us, for we're asleep in a nightmare of our own creation. In the words of Paul, dead in our trespasses and sins and the uncircumcision of our flesh. In the words of Robert Louis Stevenson, who was excommunicated from his church, excommunicated from his church there's nothing but, but grace. Nothing but God's grace, he writes. We walk upon it, we breathe it, we live and die by it. It makes the nails and axles of the universe. If you postulate a God who is the creator of all that is, isn't this the most simple and obvious deduction? I mean, it's so simple. And, and, and that is that everything that's anything is grace. In the words of St. Paul, what do you have that you did not receive? And in the words of St. Paul, quoting God in the book of Job, who has first given to God that he, might, that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And if you say, well, I have free will, which the Bible doesn't actually say, but if you do say, I have free will, who created your free will? Or do you think that your free will is the uncreated creator? Scripture says that you are made of the breath of God that is God and dust. God made the dust and you didn't make God the maker of you. So, yeah, everything that's anything is, is grace. And sin then must be an illusion about grace. As if you could like take knowledge from some tree and create yourself. And repentance must be like waking from that dream that has become a nightmare in which you are now trapped. And repentance must also be grace, if it's anything and not nothing. It must be a miracle in you. It must be like the uncaused cause in you. It must be like an imperishable seed within you. Rising from the dead. What I'm trying to say is that last week when I told you how Ben the sour milk man forgave that lady and became sweet and then how that lady found Ben and said, Ben, Ben, I've got the money, you know, for the milk, but Ben said it's already been paid. I paid it and now she looked at him as if he was Jesus and then they both started hugging and crying in the middle of the street with joy. When I told you that, you were tempted to think, That's an exception to the rule. That's an anomaly in reality. And part of you wanted to say to me, come on, Peter, get real. And I'm saying, no, that was not the exception to the rule. That was the rule. That was not the anomaly in reality. That was reality. That was two people getting real while everything else is the illusion. That was the telos. Forgiveness is the revelation of grace in this world of lies and illusion. Forgiveness is the telos. At hand, being revealed in the now. The point where eternity touches time. 
First Peter 3, 8, ta de telos, translated by the English Standard Version as finally. And weirdly, it does mean finally, but for Peter, it also means firstly and only. In other words, it's not a small thing in Peter's mind. It's everything that's anything, and I'm fixing to show you that here in just a bit. But first, we'll read through our text, okay? Unable to adequately explain everything, but pointing out some of the weirder things. That is, the, maybe the most holy things, because you see, it's actually all, I think, very simple. You know what's complex? All of our yeah buts. Yeah but, yeah but, yeah but this, yeah but that because maybe we're looking at the wrong picture. 1 Peter 3, 8, and the end, tell us. Tell us is, is normally translated end, perfection, or completion, and Jesus said, I am the tell us. And on the tree in the garden at the end of the sixth day, to tell us die, which is a conjugation of the verb, meaning it is the tell us, it is finished. 1 Peter 3, 8, and the end, all of you, same thinking, co-suffering, brother-loving, tender-hearted, and humble-minded. He's describing a living body as if he actually believed that we are living stones coming together in this living temple. Verse 9, not repaying evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. He's describing forgiveness. As if we are actually like body parts uh, to bleed or that need to bleed the life one into another. For to this you were called that you may not obtain, clarana meo, inherit a blessing. That's grace. No one earns an inheritance. You have to grow up into and inheritance. Chapter 1, Peter told us you've been born again to a living hope, right? Through the resurrection of Jesus to an inheritance that is imperishable. I love that. You know, Scripture says that God alone has immortality. I chew on that one a while. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. And then he quotes Psalm 34. Whoever desires to love life, Zoe, that's the imperishable life, Love life and see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on, epi, on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is, epi, on those who do evil. Last I checked, eyes are usually in the face. And that means the disposition of God to the righteous and to the evil is the same. He's looking at both of them. And yet it comforts the righteous, telling them who they are. The apple of his eye. While it burns the evil, telling them who they are not. Their own creation. Then he writes this, and if you know his story, this is crazy. Now, who is there to harm you, <laughs> to do evil to you, if you are zealous for what is good? And if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, blessed. In the Greek, it's just blessed. That's the eighth beatitude. <laughs> blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, said Jesus. See, I think Peter actually believed this for some crazy reason. And so when he was fleeing Nero's persecutions in Rome and has the vision of Jesus walking into Rome with a cross, he, he turned and he ran back into Rome in order to be crucified with Jesus. Because he wanted to. It was blessed. He writes, have no fear of them. Literally, in the Greek, of their fear, fear not. Nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense, apolog apologia, about the logos, and about the logos to anyone who asks you for a logos, a reason for the hope that is in you. So people should be asking, what kind of milk are you drinking? You have a hope that just won't quit. Look around you. Where's the logic in that? 
Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Fabas, that's fear. Fear, but not fear of them. Having a good conscience, consciousness, that's the consciousness we get from dwelling in the inner sanctuary, which, you know, in the Old Testament is the presence of the age to come. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be confounded, ashamed. As Peter told us, they will glorify God for your good deeds. So they will realize that all their good deeds have been evil deeds. And yet this realization will be hope for all your good deeds are grace. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than to do evil. For Christ also suffered once, hapax, sometimes translated once and for all. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in, and now flesh is in the dative. So that means in can be translated by, to, for, as, or in. In is pretty good. In the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. The first Adam became a living soul, writes Paul, but the last Adam a life-giving spirit that God may be all in all. He was made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark, fascinating study there about what that word ark is like a coffin and a boat, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were being brought safely through water. Eight, I don't know if you knew this, but eight is one plus seven. Seven are saved because of one, the Savior, Noah. In Hebrew thought, eight is an endless seven. It's the endless seventh day, the telos. Eight persons were brought safely through water. Second Peter is going to tell us that just as the world was flooded with water, it will be flooded with fire. Eight persons were saved, but who knows how many were not saved? But Jesus, crucified here, descended there to wherever that may be and preached. What do you suppose he preached? He proclaimed. And now I need to just stop and point out that these verses are really utterly incomprehensible to modern Christians, particularly modern evangelical Christians. But I think they were perfectly clear to those that read this letter 2,000 years ago. And that's because we modern readers are utterly confused by one English word with German roots. And you know what that word is? Hell. Hell, defined as endless conscious torment, is a concept that just cannot be found in Scripture and is literally excluded by Scripture. However, you will find words translated as hell in English Bibles. And so, of course, our thoughts on this topic are utterly confused and illogical. In fact, most people nowadays think of two biblical ideas as being the exact same thing, when in reality they are like, I think, like exact opposites, not equal opposites, but opposite things, and we call both of those things hell. So if you've been around a while, you've seen me do this, but I probably should do it every couple weeks. Hell number one, think of over here, with the Hebrew word Sheol, or the Greek word Hades, is transliterated into Greek, and the Septuagint is Hades. In Greek mythology, Tartarus is the lowest level of Hades, and that's important because Peter's going to talk about Tartarus a little bit in Second Peter. Hades, Sheol, is the realm of death, which is not God's will and not the work of his word. It is the realm of I am not. It's the realm of the lost, the liars, the dead, and the shadows. 
what for right now I'm going to call hell number two is extremely different. It is the eternal fire. In the Revelation, there's this lake of fire and theon translated Theon translated as both uh, brimstone and divinity. But Theon, anybody can hear this, comes from Theos, which is the word for God. Our God is a consuming fire, says Scripture, and our God is love, and his word is Jesus. It is not my word like fire, like a hammer that crushes rocks, says the, the, the prophet. So, so do you understand logos and chaos? Light and dark, uh, the way and the lost, the, the truth and the, the lies, the life and death. And hell number two is eternal. That does not mean forever without end. That's why I always say without end and not forever because they aren't the same thing. It does not mean forever without end. It actually means something entirely different which we're going to define in a, in, in a minute. But hell number two is eternal and hell number one is not, not, not. So damn not eternal. Hell number one is our bad will. And hell number two is God's will, which is the good and is always free. It is burning hot, amazing grace. There's one other word that gets translated as hell. And one other idea that we speak of as hell, and the word is Gehenna. It's the idea of judgment, and we could call it hell number three. Gehenna simply means valley of Hinnom in Hebrew, also called Tophet, meaning place of burning. Isaiah 30, verse 33. Tophet was established of old, the breath of Yahweh, like a stream of brimstone, doth set it ablaze. It's the valley that surrounds Jerusalem on two sides. It's the boundary between the new Jerusalem containing a new heaven and earth and this world of ours, this world of space and time. Hell number three is the place where hell number two confronts hell number one. At the northern end of the valley, that valley, just outside of the city walls, Jesus was crucified on a tree in a garden and cried, Father, forgive them. It is finished. It's the judgment of God. It's the light descending into the darkness. It's the truth descending into the lies. It's the way descending into the land of the lost. It's the life descending into death. It's Jesus descending into hell. Hell number two descending into hell number one. As I've discovered is described throughout scripture. And clearly stated in the oldest of creeds, the Apostles' Creed that we just, just read, and modern Christians have been told by the church that it's impossible. Verse 21, baptism which corresponds to this now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience or consciousness through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now, this is kind of amazing, but the authorities have been subjected to him for he subjected himself to the authorities according to God's will. Herod, Pilate, you, and me are just some of those authorities. 
Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, writes Peter, arm yourself, prepare yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What a statement. You see, he's talking as if we have imprisoned the life in the prison of our own self-centered flesh. As if we've been vessels of wrath that are transformed into vessels of mercy, that is, blood vessels. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Sin is damning the life. Sin is taking the life and not giving the life. The the life is in the blood. With our self-centered flesh, we make a blood clot. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time, chronos. In Greek, there are a couple words for time. Chronos means linear time, where one minute comes right after, one second right after another, chronological time. For the rest of the chronos in the flesh, no longer in human passions, but in the will of God, for the chronos that is past suffices for doing bulema, the will or the purpose or the plan of the Gentiles, the unbelievers. See, Peter, then that's crazy too, because Peter believes that there is like a, a time, a chronos, there is a time for sin. As if it has a purpose. Not its own purpose, but maybe like someone else's purpose. As if it is that which God does not will, prepared for the revelation of all that God does will. You know, like the knowledge of evil prepared for the revelation of the good, which is grace. As if God consigned all the disobedience in order that he may have mercy on all, as if there's a purpose for this nightmare. But once you wake from this nightmare, once you know it's a nightmare, you can begin to wake from the nightmare, praise God for the reality that is your home. And remember how he has addressed us throughout this whole letter, the exiles, the sojourners. Yeah, for the chronos that is past suffices for doing the will of the unfaithful. Moving about in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give back, apodidomai, logos. (laughs) Translated account here, because it can mean that, but the word is logos. Give back logos to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's another thing we pronounced in the creed. And did you get that? Uh, The dead have not been judged. (laughs) Not some dead, just the dead. They have not been judged because God's judgment is salvation. Jesus' name is Yahweh is salvation. Eternal life is his judgment. I know that his commandment is eternal life, said Jesus on Palm Sunday. Eternal life, which is an endless communion of sacrificial love that is constant forgiveness. The river of life flowing through all the members of the Adam, Adam, the eschatos Adam, in the image of God. To him who is ready to judge the living and the dead, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. That's the way Jesus does. In a pneumaticos, a spiritual body, not less real than your currently current body, but infinitely more real. Next verse, the end, the telos of all things is at hand. And now, if you fell asleep, pay attention because this is my point. Since the scientific revolution, we've been told that there is no end to all things. For there was no beginning. But now scientists have been saying for like 100 years or so, uh, we were wrong. In the words of Albert Einstein, Space and time are a stubbornly persistent illusion. And since the 5th century, we've been told by the church that there is no end to all things. 
because some things must be tortured forever without end. And since the beginning, that is what Satan has been telling all of us, including you. There's no end. No hope. No purpose, no point. There's no Jesus. Okay, and if there is a Jesus, well, he's not the beginning and the end and the way in between. There's no living hope, and he certainly is not at hand. He's forsaken you. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, said Jesus, the king. The telos, the end, the perfection, the completion is at hand, says Peter. And they both say, repent. Listen to how Peter in 2 Peter, I love this. To him, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and into the day of eternity. What's the day of eternity? In 2 Peter 2, 5, 5, or verse 9, Peter describes it as the day of judgment. And what day is that? Well, that's the day that the rains started. Uh, the, the flood came in the world of Noah. That's the day the fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the day that will end the time of punishment upon the righteous. In 2 Peter 3, 12, Peter calls it the day of God, the day of the Lord, the day of God, the day for which we are to hope when this world will be dissolved by fire and a new world in which righteousness dwells will, will be revealed. In 2 Peter 3, 8, Peter writes this, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord a day is as, well, it's like a thousand years. Thousands is the biggest Denominator. It's like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. And yet the day of eternity, sorry if I'm yelling, but this is so cool, has no beginning and no end because it is the end. It's the telos. It's the end, which is the beginning. Who is Jesus? In Genesis 1, God describes creating creation in six days or ions, which usually gets translated age, or ever. So maybe forever has an end. The days are not simply 24-hour days. According to the text of Genesis 1, and according to Peter, he, he just said it. So creation scientists are literally arguing a point that the Bible literally says is literally silly. Just don't even need to argue about that. God creates in six days that each have a beginning and an end in Genesis 1, but the seventh day has no beginning and no end. It's God's day, the Sabbath. We celebrate the Sabbath every week, but God's Sabbath is not like any old Sabbath. It has no beginning and, an, and, and, and end, and, and it's not part of chronological time. And yet, it contains chronological time and fills chronological time with all of its meaning. In Greek, logos. In the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, it's represented by an eighth day, which is an endless seventh day. Not Saturday, but like a Sunday from beyond space and time. Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, and he is the Lord of the Sabbath. What I'm saying is that time in Scripture, and I'll get a Kleenex, that I'm saying that time in Scripture uh, looks something like, like this, like this. And eternity invaded time when Jesus cried to tell us die on the tree in the garden at the end of the sixth day at the edge of the seventh. And yet, that day was a once and for all day, the edge of the eternal day, which is the revelation that Jesus will fill or has filled all of space and time. And so, if the age to come were to have a shape, it would be the shape of a man, but not just any man, the man, the Adam, the telos, our Lord Jesus. And this is the plan for the fullness of time, writes Paul in Ephesians, to unite anakephalio, all things 
in him. His body, which is a communion of sacrificial love called life, eternal life. He is the word in whom all things are made and all things hold together. So I hope you see that he is not bound by the timeline. The timeline is literally contained within him who is the beginning and the end and the way in between. I mean, like from one moment to another, the way in the eternal day, the ion to come, one moment in time does not follow another moment in time. Like cause and effect are, are, are in the same place, which means in the words of the prophet, this is how Amos says it, the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. That is, the moment you take his life on the tree will be revealed to be the very same moment that he gives his life on the tree. That is, the knowledge of evil will be filled with the very presence of the good. That is, the knowledge of death will be filled with the presence of of life, that is, sin will be filled with grace. The work of the devil will become the glory of God. In other words, hell number one will be filled with hell number two, which is the revelation of the glorious judgment of God. Hell number three, relentless, imperishable, unfading grace. Relentless love. In other words, Jesus has descended into hell and will destroy the works of the devil for in reality, he already has. You understand? Hades, Sheol can only exist on the timeline. But it comes to an end for it is immersed in the end and is in fact an illusion within the end like a bad dream on a Sunday afternoon. And so it is written, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You understand? Hades and Sheol, they can all, Hades shall only exist on the timeline. Shame, regret, fear, sorrow, darkness, death, lies, and confusion. If you think about this, past and the future, living in the now and all that, it makes sense. It can only exist on the timeline, and all of them must come to an end for the beginning and the end has descended into the timeline to fill it with himself who is the substance of all that's real, the logic of God, amazing grace. You know, the church, that is my friends, Philip Yancey, Tony Campolo, Brennan Manning can say, well, Brennan's dead now, so he says this all the time, but they can say such incredibly beautiful things about grace such that people nat naturally begin to have faith and all the evil one has to do is whisper in their ear, but hell. And what that means for most people because of what the church has told them is that there is no end of all things. There's no tell us. So people will say that they believe in grace. Why? For fear that God might not be grace. And with that lack of faith in grace, they're trapped. Where? Ugh. In hell number one. For a time. About seven years ago here at church, we had a five-week course on these things. And at the end, I remember I was concluding and I said, I think the calling upon the sanctuary is to expose Satan's big butt, but hell. And just when I said that, some hell broke loose in the back of that room. Or maybe I should say the gates of hell did not withstand the church speaking the word the word that will not return void. I know that Satan hates the timeline that's on the screen right now. I've witnessed his rage when in prayer I've taken my hands and brought them to, together and said, the end is the beginning 
And that means there's no more space for you in this place. I once watched him throw a fit while manifesting in the body of a friend because I dropped a watch. That's a chronometer, a chronos. I dropped a watch and a cup of communion wine. That's eternity. While quoting Revelation 10.6, a literal translation, chronos, time, will be no more. I know that some people think I'm crazy and some people have called me a heretic, but I'm losing my ability to care because I believe 1 Peter 3, 7. The end of all things is at hand. At hand. Next verse, 1 Peter 3, 8. Therefore, be sophroneo in the right mind, and sober for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving each other earnestly. That's relentlessly, intensely. And some people say, well, it's just theology, Peter. What does it matter? So, look around the room. Just look at some other people. Just stare at them for a minute, okay? If what Peter is saying is true, then every person in this room is a miracle. For the breath of the uncaused cause, the Spirit of God, the imperishable seed, is in each one of them. And yet imprisoned in a body of sin and death, just as uh, the seed uh, that is also imprisoned in you. But when you forgive them, and they forgive you, and you both die with Christ and rise with Christ, and Christ in you then begins to commune with Christ in them, you will realize that you are them. And together we are the very temple of the living God, the body of inexpressible delight that has no end, for it is um, the end. Has no end because it is the end. In other words, you will hold them, and you will begin weeping with them on streets of gold, just as Ben, the formerly sour milkman, held that lady who took the 79 bucks and she held him and they wept for joy and the milk never ever tasted so good. You see, that experience is not an aberration in reality. That experience is reality. It is the telos. But if what Peter writes is not true and there is no telos, Well, then that person next to you, that neighbor, might be and probably is an abomination that will be endlessly tortured by God, who is endlessly without rest, for his will cannot happen, for the works of the devil have no end, and so to love that person might be to hate God and be hated by God forever without end. Or, or maybe that person next to you is one of the few that, you know, God will endlessly pamper in a gated community for the rich and powerful who could afford to purchase amazing grace that is no longer amazing grace. No longer grace, nor amazing. While outside the city, whose gates are endlessly closed, God endlessly tortures his own imperishable seed in jars of clay, dying and never actually coming to an end, but instead endlessly existing as a reminder to those in the gated community that they win and all their enemies endlessly lose, endlessly imperfect, endlessly incomplete, endlessly a mockery to the one whose name is salvation. If what Peter is writing is not true, but it is true, I mean, is what I just described the logic of God, the first thing or the second thing? Which, which one is the logic of God who is love? The gated community where the gates are always closed, unlike in the Revelation, is that the milk that we are to deliver? I mean, I, for one, cannot think of anything more sour. And so this is our message our word that I think we are supposed to deliver to the institutional church and each one of us. Repent. For on the night that he was betrayed by all of us, I'll move this out of the way. 
On the night that he was betrayed by all of us, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body. Take it. Eat it. Stick this in your gut. <laughs> and in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he said, this is the covenant. Scripture calls it an eternal covenant. In my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins, drink of it, all of you. And do it in remembrance of me. This will be sweet on your lips. It's grace. And who doesn't want to sing, or who doesn't like to sing amazing, amazing grace? It will be sweet on your lips. But it will be sour in your stomach. For you'll come to terms with the fact that we have kept the grace to ourselves. <laughs> Refusing to forgive as we've been forgiven. It will be sour in your stomach, but when you digest the milk, it will nourish you. And you will speak it as praise to God and to everyone you meet. And once again, it will be sweet on your lips as you sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And a wretch like you. And has made all of us like him. And that's the end. The End that has no end because it is the end, the telos. Adam, in the image and likeness of God. Believe the gospel. Amen. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God. So praise thy name. We've been singing it all along. And John saw it in the Revelation. And yet he said it was already coming down. And Isaiah saw it in chapter 6 when he saw, when the cherubim, seraphim, those angel things started singing, the whole earth is full of his glory. And then you said it right there at the end of chapter 1. On the seventh day, it is good. It's all good. For all your works are finished. It is finished. Oh God, I confess that I live like 99.9% .9 of my life from outside of that place, that inner sanctuary. Where I know that to be true. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have come to draw us back into the very depths of ourselves, that we might be reunited with you and all creation in Jesus' name. Because now we know <laughs> you're amazing, you're good. And so in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Ah, so anyway, I'm really just saying believe the gospel. And uh, I wanted to point this out. I get like self-conscious about this. But 16 years ago, I was kind of preaching through these things when all hell broke loose or the word like started breaking down the doors of hell maybe a little bit. And the idea of the timeline, I talk about in this book, The History of Time and the Genesis of You, which is on Genesis chapter 1. Don't know if it's written really well, but I think the idea in it is, is so uh, incredible. Um, and this, uh, the, the, and it's that God's going to make you in his image, and he's not going to fail because he's already done it, actually. <laughs> and uh, this book, second one on Genesis chapter 2, is called God and His Body. 
that his body is this amazing thing that he's bringing together in this incredible joy. Before I die, I think maybe I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be able to write this third book on Genesis chapter 3 that I've actually been writing for the last 17 years called The Tree in the Middle of the Garden. Because the way God does that is uh, through this. And it's all just incredible news. The only thing that changes is, well, you have to give up the idea that God endlessly tortures his own creation. <laughs> Satan's big butt. So, um, in the name of Jesus... Oh, and let me just say this. This is not in the name of Jesus. Or it could be in the name of Jesus. But uh, all the pros... It, the, we, that's why these are in the back. But if, you wanna, if you're watching online, you want to get these, they're on Amazon. There's an old version and a new version. But all the proceeds go to, this, go to the sanctuary while I'm employed here. Because I really think this is what we are, uh, we're called to do is... Um, Annihilate Satan's big butt uh, in Jesus' name. Believe the gospel. Amen.